Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. I'm pretty sure this is video 52. My name's Andy. We are doing the exercises for the foreign function interface stuff in Rust. So basically how to interoperate with uh, stuff written in other programming languages from Rust. Uh, this time we're looking at how to use uh, cargo bind gen to uh, generate some bindings for some existing C code. So it's all happening in here. This is our readme file. Um, what we're going to make bindings for is the tweet NACL library, which is nothing to do with tweeting, confusingly. I'll um, just look this up. It is a set of cryptographic functions. The, the word tweet comes from the fact that they fit into only, only a few tweets or something. So they're like short, they're short implementations. NACL is, a, I think, a, a reasonably well known set of cryptographic operations. Um, so the point is, there's some clever C code that is very standard. So in our Rust, we want to be able to um, use that code instead of writing our own version of it, maybe. Um, so we want to wrap this C code in an, um, an interface in Rust that is natural and safe to use. So let's follow the instructions. So first of all, do we have a C compiler? Well, yes, I do. Uh, I have Clang installed. You'll need Clang or GCC installed. And I think these examples use Clang, so it might be best to, to use that. And we'll need bind gen. So I just installed bind gen by saying cargo install bind gen CLI. And there it is. It's already installed because I just installed it. Uh, so what the first thing we need to do is generate some bindings. So let's have a look at what we've got so far. So, so far we've got, um, a source with it, uh, which contains a uh, lib and a main. We've got a build RS. Not sure what's in there. Cargo.toml, uh, and then some C code in these, um, tweet NACL files. And if we look at the, tweet nacl.h file. There's a whole load of hash defines. And then here are some functions. Um, I guess some of these are the ones we're going to be wrapping. Gosh, there's a lot in here. Okay, so um, we're going to run bind gen. By doing this. So bind gen tweet and so basically run bind gen which we've now installed so it should be there uh, give it the header file we need to um, read and then the output should go into source slash bindings.rs so now we should have a new file called bindings.rs and here it is and it's got a whole load of functions which are basically saying this function exists in the in the c um, oh there's a whole load of constants defined up here and then here well, these are all the, the functions that are actually um, defined in C. And we can see they've all got these weird argument types from the std OS raw crate, uh, or rather standard library module. Um, but basically, it's generated as a whole load of um, function definitions that we can call from our Rust. Fair enough. So now we're going to use build.rs to compile and link tweet NACL. So basically, similar to what we did in the one of the previous exercises, we're going to include uh, like doing a C compile into our Rust build by modifying a build.rs um, to contain this stuff. Well, hold on. This The thing we've got here already is probably better, right? Yeah, it's the same, but just slightly, slightly better. And then I accidentally pasted this stuff in. It shouldn't go here. So we're going to add CC to our build dependencies in cargo.toml. And that's going to cause us to rebuild. And now, yeah, this, this stuff tells cargo you should, you should re, rerun this build.rs if either of these files changed. And this says like compile the C, the C file into, uh, into a thing called tweet NACL dot A. So when we build now, hopefully, got a load of warnings, but we should have also somewhere built a tweet NACL dot A. Um, not sure where, maybe in um, that same place. Yeah, there we are. Tweet NACL. No, not not actually sure 
where that's gone to. So let's not worry about that for now. Let's just trust that it worked. And what's next? Create a, a source slash lib.rs with pubmod bindings, which I think we've got. Yep, that came with it. Um, which means that main.rs can now use bindings. So let's cargo check. And it seems okay apart from all the warnings. Oh, we, we missed a bit, did we? I think they said, oh, is it coming? Um, oh yeah, uh, yeah, it's just coming. Yeah, sorry, I, I haven't done this uh, exercise before, but I've read ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, the build.rs, uh, sorry, the bindings.rs creates a load of warnings. We can turn them off by replacing build.rs with this. Okay, turn off warnings in our main, so we can do that. All right, warnings are already off in our main. Let's just double check what we were supposed to do. Is it the same? Looks the same, fine. So we turned off warnings just so that our build doesn't give us any problems. And also at the top of bindings.rs, let's add this one line. So this is this was all generated code, and we're adding one manual line. So I'm not sure, but I'm wondering whether this comment might mean that Rust bind gen will not replace this if it regenerates, and we'll leave that there, but I don't know. Um, but either way, the warnings have gone away. So if we cargo check now, no warnings from the build process, no warnings from the that file. So the the thing about this is that some of these variable names don't aren't all uppercase, even though they're constants, um, global constants. So they should be, but um, we can just tell it to be quiet about that. Okay, so uh, let's inspect our bindings. That's what it says to do next. So we can look for crypto hash sha five hundred and twelve. So crypto hash. Sha512. Um, and it was called, it was underscore tweet, was it? That we wanted. Yep, so these are not the C function, these are some constants. So the C function is here. So we found it. It takes three arguments um, a pointer to a uchar, a mutable pointer to a uchar, a pointer to a uchar and a long long and then it returns uh, an int so that looks similar to what they said so some observations the definition is inside of an external c block with no body so that means that rust expects it to be provided by some other code that we're going to link in it's public meaning we can use it in our code and we need to figure out what the arguments mean. So obviously we should read the documentation, um, which is here. No, I'm not following. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there is, here's the function in the C header file. There is no documentation. So we've got to figure it out. So hopefully somewhere there's some documentation, but anyway. So argument one is a mutable pointer to a sequence of bytes. We can just confirm that by looking back. So look, it's a mutable pointer, that's what that means. So um, they're saying that's probably the output from this function. So C functions um, will quite often take a mutable pointer for the um, place where I'm going to put my answer. And then argument two is a constant pointer, so that must be some kind of input, a sequence of bytes. Um, and uh, arg three is a length, not sure what of yet. And most likely return value, because that we've already seen there's an output parameter, Return value is probably just to give some kind of error code to say whether it succeeded or failed. Um, and these are this is obviously this is a hassle to call this function from Rust. So what we're going to do is make some nice Rust that wraps around this so that it's easy to use. So they're going to take us through a process of um, what we might do, and they they actually kind of change their minds about the signature a few times in here, but I think we should actually do each of these things and see how it goes. So we'll start off with something that is a kind of a, um, a fairly straightforward translation of the C into Rust, which is um, we can assume that that input, we are going to assume that that input parameter is 
um, a, a pointer to the beginning of a list of bytes, and the third argument is the length of that list of bytes. So in Rust, we're going to write a function more like this. So let's write it in... Uh, maybe we'll write it in lib. I'm not sure exactly where we're supposed to write it. Um, and then we're going to call bindings crypto hash blah 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 tweet and we're going to pass in the output parameter so I assume that's going to be out dot um, has meet putter so basically giving out a pointer to out so that the, the user can write into it and then we're going to call we're going to pass in a pointer to the data um, which is uh, this data dot as putter and then data dot len like so um, and th this should be a correct thing and then we're just going to return the answer that comes back from there and it hopefully that will just convert itself automatically now this is unsafe because it calls a an external C function so we've got no way of knowing what that does so it's unsafe so we have to wrap it up in unsafe and every time we wrap it in unsafe, we should say why. So safety. Um, hopefully, the hopefully out is big enough, right? <laughs> because otherwise, um, this thing might write into out right beyond the end of out, so that doesn't sound very safe at all. This is not, you know, this is not a very good safety comment so far. Um, and then we could say data. Uh, I mean, data is a slice, so its start and length are valid, right? So basically, if someone gave us a, a, a slice then we can be sure that we're giving the right information into this function, assuming, of course, these are the pointer and the length, but we assume we got that right. Now, uh, for this, I, I read ahead, and you can do this, which just says, okay, I know it's a use size, but just treat it as a U64, which is what it um, what it was asking for, because it's the actual type of this function is a long, long, which in, in rusty terms comes out of the U64. So now we've got some code that calls this um, and it's not safe because this is a terrible clanger but this bit of it's safe so now we can run this code so let's do that so we're going to call um, well what are we going to call now the name of this library which I guess is uh, tweet NACL so tweet NACL bindgen yeah that's right that's the name of this project and then it has one function, hash this thing, it takes in an out and a data. And then I don't know, we've got to, uh, we're going to print out out, I guess. And out is going to be, uh, let's just make it be a vec for now. And data is going to, well, it's got to be a slice of U8s. So what if we just did um, A, B, C, D, E, F, right? Something like that. And we, we let this be a mutable reference to out that we're passing in. And then uh, this, we've got to turn it into a string or something. Um, we're not really sure what hashing, I guess hashing returns an array of U8, so, or a rec of U8. So, we need some way of displaying this. So, um, we could convert it into a string lossily, but maybe some kind of, um, maybe we could just turn it into a vec of, numbers and then print that out like what if we just what if we just debug print it that should be good enough okay so there's a there's a deliberate error in this code let's run it and it should crash i guess yeah segmentation fault 
So did you spot the deliberate error in this code? Well, we said, hopefully, out is big enough. And then we just went ahead and passed in out to crypto hash shat 5112 tweet um, and hoped that uh, the person had passed in a big enough thing. Now, the person actually passed in an empty vector. So, nope, it's not big enough. So let's just, for the sake of argument, let's make it big enough. Which I happen to know from reading ahead is that it needs to be 64 big. So it doesn't matter what we put in here, we just need the vector to be the right size. So we can just say out dot then. Set equal, I guess. The length of out is 64. Now when we run it, oh look, it works. We got back some numbers. We don't really know whether this has been hashed correctly, but it, it seems pretty likely to me. Um, all right, so I guess the first thing we should do is take this assertion and put it inside this function, like so. Because if that's not the case, things are bad. So we, I guess, you know, what we could do is make this function unsafe um, and then put a big comment on it saying, the thing you pass in must be 64. Out must have length. Length 64. Right. But if we made, we could make this function unsafe and just say you have to do that, but we're just going to check it here and, and crash. If not, still works. Now if we try now passing in, if we forget to do this, we only do we only add a few things in there, then it panics, saying nope, the uh, length should have been 64. So that's kind of our first attempt, and this actually is not much safer than the original C version. It's like a little bit better, but it's not really taking advantage of um, how good Rust is. So let's make a, a one little step forward, which is that our output thing should be exactly 64 in length that can actually be part of our type signature and then it doesn't need to we don't need an assertion anymore we can just say yep you've got to pass me in a slice of length 64. now that means that out as a vec is no good but it's okay we can make a new thing which is exactly 64 in size uh, which is an array of length 64 which i think is like this Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so the type of out is um, 64 U8s, right? And we initialize them all with zero. So now our code should run and work. It does. And now we've guaranteed in the, in the type signature that out is the right size. So that's nice. Um, but what else can we do here? Well, um, it still doesn't feel very natural. Um, the answer that we're printing out is out, but we're not, we're kind of ignoring the return value. Um, so what should we do next? Um, well, let's continue with this. So let's, well, no, first of all, we need to figure out the return value. So it happens to be the case that this particular function, if we look at it in the C, um, which is going to be hard to do. So uh, believe me, because I read the readme, um, that this always returns zero no matter what. So actually the return value of this function is no use. So let's just get rid of it. Like so. Now it's going to complain, but it's okay. We just put a, no, we just put a semicolon here to say return nothing instead of the thing. Everything still works. So yeah, um, return value was no use in this particular function, so let's not provide it in the signature. Now, the thing about this signature is taking in this um, output buffer and then returning it isn't really a very rusty thing to do. A much more rusty thing to do would be to return an array of 64U8s that you own, like so, right? Um, and we can do that. So first of all, we could just... No, we couldn't. Um, I was going to say we could just return it out here, but that won't work. Because that is a slice of 64-bit U8. So instead of that, let's make one in here. 
Because actually, we need basically the person out there, outside our function, to do this, right? So why not just do it here? And let's get rid of this. So now we only take one argument, which is our input, and we just return our output. And we've got to use it correctly. So instead of making an out and passing it in, we just get it back. Like so. And see how much nicer this is getting. So now we've got what looks like a very nice interface on this function. It still works exactly the same way. Still safe, or it's safe, getting safer all the time. And now we can never accidentally allocate the wrong size of thing or resize it later. It's just we got back 64 bytes exactly from this function uh, by creating those 64 bytes and returning them. So next thing we can do, if we want to, so I, I might, oh, hold on, let's think about safety a little bit. Uh, so now we can say out is definitely big enough. Out is exactly the required size. And yeah, data is just like so it starts to make this still valid, still true. Um, so um, I would probably stop there, but what you can do is go even further. So notice when we create out that we're actually um, zeroing out all these bytes, even though um, it happens to be the case because we've read the C, we have to read the C code to know this, but it has to be the case that actually um, uh, this function will always um, overwrite all 64 bytes of out, no more and no less. So we don't actually need to initialize the memory with this zero. What we can do instead is we can use maybe uninit. Um, like this, is that right? I haven't used maybe uninit before, so I might be doing it wrong. Um, now, how do you do it? You make, you create something Oh, okay. We need to give a type here, so we can say it's a maybe on init of um, array of u8. No, maybe on init of u8s, maybe, I guess. And then out is going to be, we need to somehow convert that back, so we can assume in it. Now, it's the wrong type because I've done the wrong type, so yeah, yeah. So this should be a maybe on init of uh, an array of u8 of length 64. Something like that. Um, when we assume in it, that's unsafe and it should be. And also this is wrong. So I guess this should be... How does maybe uninit work? We need to we need to tell it surely how much memory to allocate here. Um, all right, let's do some reading um, and figure out how to do this. Like so. So, we can either make it um, make it zeroed and then assume it's in it, uh, or we can make an uninit and then oh, so this would be bad, right? Making some uninitialized memory and then assuming it's initialized. But yeah, I'm just looking at what. How do we say um, that? The amount of uninitialized memory you should make is space for 64 bytes. So here we're making space for one i32, I think. So I think we're doing the right thing. Um, by, by declaring it in this way and saying, look, this is make space for 64 u8s, but they're, they're uninitialized at the moment. Pass it into this function, um, which is expecting a pointer to u8, but is getting a pointer to an array of u8. So I guess we want to do something like 
I mean, we, maybe we want to do Asputer again or something. We want a pointer to the first one. Um, so what about right? No, that's actually overwriting it. We definitely want a mutable pointer, but we want it to be a different type. What if we just kind of cast it like this? Okay, all right, that feels dangerous to me, but it does seem to work. So we got back a, a mutable pointer to an array of U8s, and then we just said, oh, and treat that as a pointer to a U8, which it, it, it is in a way, so that's fine. Now we're going to assume in it, but this is obviously unsafe, because how is Rust supposed to know that this the out has become initialized. All it knows is it was definitely uninitialized. Then we passed it in to sort to a function. Now, like we need to say safety. Uh, we happen to know that crypto blah writes all sixty four bytes of its output array. Therefore, all 64 bytes of out are initialized, and this is all safe, and when I cargo run, it won't crash, it'll just work fine, which it does. Look at that. So good. All right, so we've done pretty well. Um, this feels to me like kind of the best, um, the best implementation of a, like a wrapper around this thing that we can do. This maybe uninit stuff makes me a bit nervous, um, but it makes sense, so it's probably fine. So let's read through the, the, the story, the story that they wanted us to take. So they basically, we started out with, whoops, this, um, uh, this signature, and then they are like taking us through the story that I just took us through, and I read this ahead, which is why hopefully what I did matches up. So they say by looking at the source code, we can see the contract is stronger. The output is always 64 bits wide, and we only ever return zero, which means we don't care about the return value. And look, they've shown us the code here. So there's a return zero here, so we know for sure. And we can see, look, from one, well, actually, I won't, I won't try and speculate about how this code works, but it, it, they say it overwrites all 64 bytes, like we said. So, um, they're saying we can model that. So first of all, like, like we did, pass in a, um, a reference to an array or a slice uh, of exactly 64 bytes. And even better, we can return that array directly and it will all be fine basically um, we just need to do the transformation that we have done and there should be no performance penalty there um, some notes here about the cobi actually says if you if you ha return a large thing then actually the stuff goes on the stack not there um, then yeah, then we use a pointer, basically. Yeah, they're like, basically it's going to turn out the same underneath, is what I'm saying. So, now we've got the signature. Um, we're going to call it with these three arguments. This is all the stuff we've just done, right? Um, so, oh yeah, this, oh sorry, no, this is, yeah, no, it's fine. So we wrote our code in lib. They're writing their code in main. That's where this is a bit different. So in lib, we can get at this function by just using bindings, colon, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in main, to call that function, we have to go through the package name, tweet, nacl, bind gen, fine. Um, blah, 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 blah. Bindings is the module name. On the implementation. So do it all in an unsafe block. Pass in the arguments. We've done all this. Um, and then for data, it's as putter and len as underscore. This is the bit I read ahead where we can see that. So basically, this is a U size. It needed a U64, but if you just as it, it just does it does the right thing. And then we, uh, we they're creating a, a 64 byte array, and then they're doing a reference to result as a mutable reference to an underscore. So we've done, I think what we've done is equivalent. So we said as mute putter, as they said, a reference to it as mute putter. 
Oh, but they're not using maybe on init yet. So, all right. So this was just a way of getting, um, right. Yeah. A reference to result. So like a slice. And then you just say as. All right. So I think calling dot as mute putter is probably a nicer thing, which is what we did. But now here's the thing about uninitialized memory. Again, I read ahead. So that's how I knew that this might happen. So yeah, they're doing the same thing as us. They're making a maybe uninit of the whole thing and saying just create that with uninitialized memory, um, which obviously is normally like a recipe for crashes. But because we know we're going to overwrite all of them, we can do as mute putter. Yeah, yeah. So we did the, we did equivalent of this. We just actually wrote slightly less, didn't we? Um, but yeah, so we could have done. We could have made it a little bit more explicit like this, and that should still work. But either is fine. That was not what I meant to do. All right, there you go. Um, yeah. Uh, everything else is the same. And there, assume init is inside this, the same unsafe block. So I'm actually a little bit happier having these two different unsafe blocks for the two different things that we're doing here. Um, all right, so now they're explaining it maybe on init, so probably they do it better than me. So maybe uninit is an abstraction for potentially uninitialized memory. The uninit method gives us a chunk of definitely uninitialized memory that can store our thing, which in this case was a, an array of uh, 64U8s. Um, and then it, what they're saying is you can look at the um, IR code that comes from the compiler to see, to verify that this is what's happening. So LLVM is the compiler we use to compile Rust, un, like underneath Rust what Rust, what the Rust compiler emits is LLVM IR, which stands for intermediate something. <laughs> um, and that's like assembly language like stuff that gets passed into LLVM, which it then optimizes it and compiles it. Um, so we can see that if we take the one, the function that we wrote originally that zeroes out the memory, it has a mem set call in the middle of it just here. Uh, don't worry about all the rest. Whereas if you use the maybe uninit, there is no mem set call in here. So we're doing less work. That's the point. Um, all right. So that was really all we needed to look at. So just, to look, I guess just to go over one more time what we did to wrap up this thing. So we had some C code and a header file and we ran bind gen, giving it the header file and uh, a source file to write out into. That wrote out all our stuff into here, which has all these fun signatures of all these C functions. And then what we did was wrote a Rust function that wraps the C function. We started out with one that looked very much like the C function, and we gradually ended up with one that feels more idiomatic Rust, which returns its a return value instead of taking it in as an argument, which is nice and efficient in Rust, like Rust does this so that it, it looks nice to us, but it's just as efficient as the C version. Then we created some uninitialized memory uh, passed that in as the output parameter to our C function. Also passed in the other thing that the C function needs. And then now we know it's initialized, we can just basically effectively cast it to the actual array of 64 U8s um, and return it. And then actually calling that function is just a matter of this is at this point, this is just a Rust function that takes normal Rust types, returns the thing, and then we can print it out. So that was how to wrap something a bit more real uh, in some Rust code. And also, I guess it was a little bit of waffle about why we go to the effort of making a wrapper like this instead of just writing code against these raw interfaces. Uh, it's basically because it's really painful to use them. So let's do it once um, and make it make it just a nice, easy to use function that other people can use without worrying about it. Uh, hope you enjoyed. See you next time for the last Rust 101 video.